Hello everybody, this episode is sponsored by Wow Boutique. You didn't hear it from me, but what better time to get a great deal on the best clothes than now? You can come out of these COVID times with an excellent wardrobe. Wow Boutique is here for you. They carry your favorite brands at prices that you won't believe. Doors open every day at 9 a.m. except for Saturdays and Sundays. They're located at the Uptown Liquor Store in Viewfort. Okay, so hop over to Wow Boutique uh, at the Uptown Liquor Store in Viewfort. And when you get there, tell them we sent you. For more information, you can call 715-0793. There we go. Hello and welcome, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Family Reflections. My name is Keddy Emmanuel, and I am on the call here today with Mrs. Lydia Batil Faisal. Uh, Mrs. Faisal, can you just tell the people hello? Hi, guys out there. Hi, everyone. My name is Lydia Faisal. As you know, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> And we're glad to have you. We're very glad to have you. Um, folks, I want to tell you all, um, we will be, be discussing today something that has been bothering me. It's something I heard from uh, some family. It's something that I've been seeing play out. And um, I kind of want to know a little bit more about it. And I think uh, it's possible that a conversation here today with uh, Mrs. Faisal may just kind of educate me a little bit. Um, uh, and I think it's going to be a really productive conversation for all of us and for all of you listening in. Um, if you're watching this right now and you like Family Reflections, you like I Know the Pictures, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Um, and let a friend know about it. Let a friend know what's going on here. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think we'll all be better for it. Um, so that being said, uh, Mrs. Faisal, um, coming right out the gate, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to become a lawyer? If you guys didn't know, she's a lawyer. So, <laughs> Okay, well, I came from an agricultural background in that I worked previously as an agricultural extension officer, as an agricultural credit officer with the Sanusha Development Bank. And then I also worked before that as a teacher of agriculture at the Nikut Primary School and at the Nikut Secondary School. Um, I wanted to find myself in a profession which I believe I would be very competent in without having to depend on anybody for a monthly salary. I wanted to be my own boss. I, I think I was tired of working within the system for everybody else except for myself. I wanted to command my effort, command my wages, command everything to do with my output and my um, in input. And so I decided um, with my, my background in, in language and, and loving English and loving writing and so on, I, I felt that I had the, the basic trappings to challenge a, a legal um, career. And, and so I went for it. Okay. I must say before I went for it, um, I'm happy to say that I, I did my, my reflection and um, I, I did my, my prayer and fasting. If people didn't believe that I was capable of that, I did my prayer and fasting and I believe I, I got the, the answers that I, I, I needed to get to give me the assurance that it was okay to go ahead. And so I did on faith. Okay. So your, your faith has, has a, a big part to play in uh, your journey, right? It has everything to do with my journey. It has everything to do with my life. It has everything to do with how I live and what I believe in. Okay, okay. That, that, that's, that's admirable. Well, you need the support of your family because I had the support of my husband and my children. They understand, they cooperated with me. And so <clears throat> that, that is also important. All right, so uh, nobody's an island, right? And you need to you need to have people on your side as well. And yeah, you need to have the support system. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely going back to nobody's an island, and uh, it pays to to you know if you need some help to ask for help. Uh, but uh, again, with uh, hard work and faith, and um, you know pulling your resources, it's it's possible to achieve your dream. Um, so. That being said, um, 
I want to really hop into hop into the the subject for today. Um, I know personally, I know two young men who are currently at the body laid correctional facility here in St. Lucia. And um, they, they are, have, are being accused of committing violent crimes. Um, and uh, for that reason, they have been held on remand or in pretrial at, at the facility. And I was told um, that this is a problem here in St. Lucia. I was told that there are a lot of people um, at the facility who have not been, uh, have not sat on a, a trial and they, they're just being held and they either can't make bail or, you know, they, they just, they're just there. <laughs> and years are passing and they are just there. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. Um, how would you say, or uh, and, uh, how do you say this came about? Okay. Um, I know what you speak of, and it has been a perpetual cry of practitioners and the public at large. Um, but no one individual or situation is responsible for the current problem of persons on remand for prolonged periods. When a person is arrested and charged, the criminal process began, has just begun. So it involves several stakeholders, including the police, the defense counsel, if the, if, the, if the defendant has a counsel. It involves the prosecution. It involves the court office and court officers. And it, it even involves the availability and or the condition of the court venue, okay? okay. So all of those situations or institutions or individuals have to come together so that that one mechanism has to flow fluidly for, for, for the issue of remands to be stemmed or I prolong remands to be stemmed. Everybody has to come together in a cohesive manner so that the thing can work properly. Now, you know, when there are several stakeholders um, pushing towards one eventuality and there are people pushing in different directions who are not of the same mindset that there are going to be um, there's going to be some breakdown along the way okay? okay so if any of those individuals or group do not function adequately or to the required standard the process of dealing with the accused person following his arrest can be problematic Okay. Okay, the problem may also arise if the accused being guilty chooses not to exercise the guilty plea option that he has. And he opts to go all the way hoping to get off on a technicality or hoping something happens to get him off. But only the accused knows if he is guilty or not. Okay, so and let, let me just hop in before we before we dive into uh, what the guilt the guilty or or what the the the, the person who commits the crime is doing, uh, maybe we can uh, kind of break down the roles that each of those stakeholders um, play in the process, and maybe we can just kind of outline uh, what uh, the police or the court um, or what okay. each of those mm -hmm. segments contribute to the process. Okay, so the whole process starts with the police. So the police will arrest and charge the individual. And then after he's arrested and charged, then the police will, the case will be lodged and then the process of the trial begins. They, the accused now has to find a defense counsel if he can afford it. If he can't afford it, he probably will run his own defense. I have seen certain defendants with the intellect to do it, do it successfully. They defend themselves and they get off successfully. It's always easier if you're not guilty. <laughs> I have also seen the legal aid step in. We'll come to that a little later. And whatever constitutes the defense, they step in at this stage to represent the defendant's cause against the charges or the allegations against him. 
Now, the prosecution's responsibility is to prove the guilt of that person to the required standard. After all, through the police office, officers, the, the, the person has been arrested and charged. He has, he's not bound to say anything. He could just become a, 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 a mute from mm -hmm. the day he's arrested until the case is finished. He has to say, he's not bound to say anything if he doesn't wish to. Because it is the duty of the prosecution, the police, the DPP, all of the officers involved in trying to find that person guilty, it is their duty to find him guilty after they have taken his liberty away and charged him with an offense. So this is the prosecution. Now we have the court office and the court officers. We have the court office where the charges are lodged. The police will, will lodge the charges in the court office. The court office will process the, the documents and those documents will be served on the defendant or his attorney. The court office will set the matters down for hearing. They will schedule the different adjournments if the matter is adjourned for any reason. They will make sure that the matter is, is coming up on an appropriate date, not on a holiday, not on a, on a Sunday or Saturday, but on an appropriate date. Make sure the whole administrative aspect of prosecution runs smoothly. That's the court office and the court officers. The court officers will also assist the magistrate in the court or the judges and so on and so forth. They will probably transcribe the proceedings while it's, while it's taking place, record it properly and so on. And also the availability and condition of the court venue is also critical because in St. Lucia, from my experience, the court venue has played a very integral role in assisting with the backlog of cases. Because mm -hmm. I remember, I think it was in 2015, I'm not too sure, but I remember the day when I had a matter that was adjourned at the building on Pena Street in Castries. That's the main court building that we grew up knowing. And then that matter was adjourned because they said that the court office, the court building had mold and they wanted to fix it. And then as far as I understood, the court, the court office was repaired at a very high price, but up to a day like today, the air quality has not been found fitting for it to be re-inhabited. So it remains empty after money was spent on fixing it. <laughs> and then the court is strolling all over Castries. We have been to the fisheries complex. We have been to Naira court. We have been to Laplace Carinage. We have been all over Castries. People are strolling between courts. Litigants are getting lost. When they believe they're at Laplace Carinage, they're supposed to be at Naira Court. When they're supposed to be at Naira Court, sometimes they're at Laplace Carinage. So we're all over strolling. And this has contributed significantly to the problem. So everybody's matter is adjourned, adjourned for a long time while we're searching and packing up from one building to go to relocate in another. So these are the, the integral parts of the machinery that right. um, that runs the system, the court system. Okay, and I'm, I'm trying my best to wrap my head around all of these pieces. Um, I think a good approach, um, because uh, I'm not very well versed with the legal process, um, <laughs> not, not, this isn't my field. Um, so I kind of want to know what each segment of the process or each of the, each stakeholder could do wrong. I know we, we just talked about the venue, right? We just talked about the venue not being available. Um, but uh, starting from the initial arrest where this person is now interacting with the police, what goes wrong in this process? Uh, could the police then make mistakes in filing the charges? And so the person has to wait until corrections can be made, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -mm. Well, a lot of things can go wrong there. I always, I have always been an advocate for um, the, every police station to have the assistance of an uh, assigned um, Crown Council. That's my thinking. I'm thinking that we have quite a few very competent Crown Councils now in the DPP's office. And I'm thinking that each police station could have um, one assigned Crown Council, so that if the police officer is about to file a charge, he could call the, that particular lawyer to say, look, 
um, I have arrested somebody for an offense. Can you assist me in guiding me through to um, the, proper, the appropriate, the most appropriate charges? You see, so if there is this kind of um, dialogue and interaction, then the, the chances of the police officer, the prosecutor making an error as to the appropriate charge can, um, it can be, it can be avoided. Okay. I, I remember being involved in one matter and after we had completed cross-examination, after the, the um, plaintiff had put their case forward, had put their case forward, um, we cross-examined him and then after we cross-examined him and he realized that there were a lot of deficiencies in his case, he attempted to amend, he made an application to the court to amend the charges, to amend the matter. And we vehemently opposed and we said, no, you have gone all of this way into the matter that you charged the defendant for. You have accused the defendant of A and you have come to court and given evidence in support of A. But you clearly realize that you have you, you are going down a path that might not lead to success. And so you will, before we can, we can make a no case submission or ask the court to say that there's no case has been made out against the defendant, you attempt to apply to amend. So, you know, in, and that case would have been, well, it, the case never finished, but if it had finished, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened. We believe that it would have been dismissed. So in order for the prosecution and the state not to lose all of these resources, you had a police officer involved, you have the court office, you have the magistrate's time, and then you get to this point and it has to be dismissed. I'm thinking the better thing to do is to get the assistance of Crown Counsel at the very beginning. And so when you file your charge, the likelihood of it being dismissed for technicalities or, or, the, or the wrong charge, it's, it's much, it's, it's, it's lessened. All right. And can you just let myself and the viewers know a, a bit more about what the Crown Council is? Okay, well, as I said, I am not an expert in criminal law, but I have <laughs> sufficient knowledge, I think, to answer those questions because they are quite basic. The Crown Council, as the, as the name implies, they work for the Crown. Now, unfortunately, we still use that old, that old terminology, the <laughs> Crown. Yeah. Uh, it signifies the Queen or the State. So the Crown Council is another name for state council i prefer to say government council okay at the uh, end of the day. yeah yes. it's funny that we're still using crown council um, yes <laughs> the, does the crown council ever operate as a public defendant is that similar to a public no, no, well if the crown council is working for the state then the, yeah. the function is to prosecute on behalf of the state okay. because when somebody is arrested say i am i am accused of an offense and I am charged by the police and I'm arrested and charged by the police. The person whom I have committed the offense against, if it's against um, a person and not property, for example, if it's against a person, the person becomes the witness for the crown. Okay, because the right. case is not the person against me. Once the state is involved, it is the state against me. So the state steps into the person's shoes because the state has made the, what I have done a criminal offense. In the books, it is a criminal offense. So the state is the entity that, that um, prosecutes persons for breach of the criminal code, all of the offenses in the code. So if I have, um, say, um, assaulted somebody, they will arrest me, charge me, and the person is the witness to say that I did the act but the crown, the, 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 the state or the government's um, lawyers are the ones prosecuting me. If I am found guilty, I can be sent to jail or I can be, I can be uh, made to pay compensation. Yeah. That does not preclude the person after I have been sent to jail to, for punishment, that does not preclude the person from filing civil charges against me in addition to me taking my jail. So whilst I'm in jail regretting what I have done, the person is now going to a lawyer who is going to say, okay, during the time you assaulted so-and-so, he was unable to go to work because he was traumatized. 
So he didn't work for 10 days. His salary is 150 a day. So you owe him 150 by 10 days. You also owe him his legal fees and so on and so forth. So I have to also be exposed. I'm also exposed to civil liability in respect of that criminal offense. So a long story short, be good guys. <laughs> don't yes. don't it do bad easier, things. It is easier and cheaper to be on the right side of the law. I, I, I beg all young people, young men and young women, if there's, a, if there's something is illegal or if something is a crime, please do not participate in it because if you are caught, the consequences are severe. Right, right. Uh, so, okay, I'm imagining a situation where someone is um, unable to pay for legal representation and this person is not um, capable of defending themselves, right? Um, which is a situation I can see happening very often. Uh, what, what, what is the other option there? Okay, well, many lawyers in St. Lucia, they, as part of our, um, as part of our charge as, as, as public officers, I believe we are, we have a duty, a moral duty to assist certain persons when they cannot afford legal representation. But what tends to happen when you put yourself out as that kind of person is that people tend to abuse your, your goodwill and everybody who comes to your office expects to walk out having um, given you a brief to do and there's no money following it. Mm -hmm. So whereas maybe in 10 cases you can do one or two pro bono, but you still have to eat. So um, what the government has done recently was to set up what is called the legal aid office. Now, the legal aid office, unfortunately, now it is only manned by one legal officer. And that legal officer will assist people who have been charged with criminal offenses and cannot afford to pay. Now, where um, the charge is murder, usually the state Apart from the legal aid office, the state will, will pay the local lawyers. There are some local lawyers who are known, well known to represent persons who cannot afford to defend, to, to defend themselves. So the state will pay counsel for those people charged with murder. But I believe for the other offenses, the state, you would have to go and face the, the legal aid office. Unfortunately, the legal aid office is this one lawyer for now so it, it is difficult for, um, say, the, 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 maybe the 100 or more persons who are now on remand who cannot afford a lawyer to look to the legal aid office. Right. Whereas the legal aid, aid office will look to assist everybody, people have to take a line as it were, you know? They take a line and when, when he gets to you, then it's your turn. Yeah. So for that, the remand process, the fact that you cannot afford your own defense makes the remand process even more onerous. But I believe since it is the duty of, or the obligation of the prosecution to, to prove the, in, the guilt of that accused, because you have arrested me, as I said earlier, I'm not bound to say a single thing. You have, you arrested me, you charged me, find me guilty. Okay, so if the, the defendant takes that position, then I believe the state has a, an obligation to make available to those persons um, more lawyers to, to, to make defenses for them from the legal aid office. All right. And I, I was actually going to come to that question because it, it sounds like, first of all, I'm happy that we have the legal aid office. Um, I can't imagine what it was like before we had that, um, that uh, legal aid office. Uh, but I think it sounds like it's very, like it, it really needs. Uh, it's on demand. Yeah, it's on demand. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, what can be done to change that? How difficult is it for us to hire more lawyers to help in the legal, legal aid office? Well, only, only the government can answer that question. <laughs> um, only they can answer that question. Um, I, I really do not know why it is only one lawyer who's working at the legal aid office. I guess most lawyers prefer to own their keep as it were. 
and to make their own money instead of depending on a salary from the government as a legal aid um, officer. But as I said, it is a, our moral obligation to assist. So even if you don't work at a legal aid office and you can help one person every six months, then you can choose one person to assist out of the whole crowd, you know? Right. So we, 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 lawyers can assist, but um, the problem is there's not enough um, manpower at a legal aid office. And that is a big problem. As I said earlier, considering the fact that a man is innocent until he's proven guilty, this is, this is, I mean, this is a sacrosanct principle, you know, and um, I, I believe because of, the, of, of that principle, everybody we, we arrest and put in a cell awaiting um, trial should be treated as if they are innocent. So if we believe that they are innocent until we have proven them guilty, we should assist them if they can't afford to prove to, I, well, they don't have to prove, but if they can't afford to find a, def a defender, then it is the obligation of the state to make such defender available to them by virtue of the fact that it is the state who has arrested them, who has said they have done something wrong. And it is, it is, it is them now who have to find um, resources to pay a lawyer. And when they do not have the resources, some, sometimes they end up languishing in prison. You see, so it's, it's a kind of chicken and egg situation. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think it's a human right to have a speedy trial? Like, well, is it possible that we're violating? It is, it is a human right. It is a fundamental constitutional right. Section 8.1 of the Constitution requires there to be a speedy trial within a reasonable time. That is a fundamental right. And a lot of people sue. In fact, there was a, a, a classic case of Urban St. Bryce that recently came out. Urban St. Bryce had spent, at the time of his trial, or at the time the case came out in, in, in 2018, I think, he had, spent, he had spent about 16 years in prison. And for various reasons, for various, all kinds of things went wrong, including a lot of adjournments by his, his, his lawyers, his previous lawyers. You know, and um, he had he ended up spending 16 years without his trial being completed. And so, when his lawyer, his current lawyer, took the matter up, the judge in the high court found that he was not entitled to damages or compensation because his lawyer was the main contributor to the delay. That's what the lawyers, the the, the judge found at the high court. And when the, the lawyer appealed to the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal said, yes, they agree the lawyer may have contributed immensely to the delay, but that does not excuse the state. And it does not take away, away from the fact that the period that he was detained, 16 years, was too much time. All right. So even if the lawyer is playing delay tactics, it is up to the state to take control of the situation and say, look, you have to stop playing these delay tactics. We're going to deal with this matter once and for all and, and prosecute the matter. Right. So notwithstanding delay by the man himself or his lawyer, they found that the, the period of years was unreasonable. 16 years was too much time to have been arrested, charged, and nothing coming out of it for 16 years. Right. But how do we quantify that? I, I know you said the <laughs> section of the Constitution uh, outlines that you know there it's a human right. It's a, a everybody has the right to a speedy trial or within a reasonable time. But does that same section also kind of define what a reasonable time could be? Well, that is the problem. You see. It does not say what is reasonable time because reasonable time in one case might not be reasonable time in another case. You see what I'm saying? For example, if it is a case where the matter is so straightforward, it's a simple charge. Let us, let us say possession of cannabis. Mm -hmm. Let us say you're allowed, um, the person had probably two or three joints in their pocket and they, were, they couldn't meet the bail. So they arrested and they remain in, in bodily and they are forgotten there. 
And it is a case that could have been disposed of in very quick time. It is not a, it's, it's, it's not a, a serious matter. And that person is forgotten. Say, let us say three years have passed. Yeah. And maybe the minimum, the maximum of detention time probably would have been six months. But then because he's forgotten in the system, he had ended up spending maybe three years or four years. Now, this can never be deemed to be reasonable time. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Right. Right. But maybe in a more serious case, where the prosecution have to get witnesses from overseas, or they have to get samples tested overseas, and they have to get witnesses or experts and all this kind of thing and the bureaucracy of all of those things take time and they are ready for trial within three years. Three years in that case would not be an unreasonable time. Hmm. So it is difficult for any court to put a, a number on what is reasonable time because that would vary from case to case from person to person, from situation to situation, from circumstances to circumstances. So for example, the court closed in 2015 and all matters were adjourned. And maybe it went into three years, we couldn't find a, a, a proper place. There were different reasons. You went to another place, there was mold. Then you went to another place, there was still a bad report for air quality. And then for three years, the court is unsettled. There's a backlog. This would not be unreasonable time for which the prosecution is responsible. This is an administrative function in providing us with a court, with a, with a, with a place to have the court. So in, in my view, if, 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 the, if the Court of Appeal finds that it is unreasonable time, then the fault does not fall at the feet of the prosecution for failing to prosecute. It would fall at the feet of the state, of the, administ this, the administrative part of the, of the court system, of the judicial system, over which the DPP's office have no control. Right. So it, uh, there are a lot of different situations where, um, and periods of time where a period could be deemed not reasonable and in another set of circumstances it would be deemed reasonable so it's a case by case basis okay uh, who is responsible for the administrative section of the judicial system well it's the state the state is the one to ensure ministry of justice the state to ensure that we have a functioning courthouse it's it has the facilities that can adapt to a court it's fitted with all the things, it's soundproof when necessary and so on and so forth. So all of those um, functions fall squarely on the back of the state. The court office, the court officers, like the, the court administrator, the registrar, they're responsible for ensuring that matters are listed and matters are adjourned and people are notified and notices are sent out and the bailiff serves the summonses and the divorce hearings and so on and so forth and those kinds of things. Okay. So um, these are the officers, but unless we have a stable office, a stable base, then the officers will not be able to function effectively. Okay. So, and, and when you say a stable office, uh, are you referring to, because what I, what I was getting from what you were saying is I was imagining that in order for us to, really fix the administrative section of the justice system. We really need to have some intervention uh, from the ministry, right? And have significant investment from the mm -hmm. that ministry in government. Um, but I was kind of derailed when you said that the offices, I kind of got lost there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, what I was trying to say is this. I believe the problems of the court started about sometime in 2015 or thereabout. And I remember that case that I was doing, it was a very important case. And it was adjourned because they said they wanted to do some work in the court on Pena Street. And that it was initially, we were initially um, adjourned, I think, for three months. We had, we had to wait for three months, something like that. I can't recall accurately, but it was adjourned for a reasonable period of time. It wasn't too long. And then the adjournment just kept repeating and repeating and repeating until they had to find another building. 
And then sometimes when they found other buildings, they had similar mold problems. Right. So the problem, the difficulty I have is, is, is that we have a court at, um, there's one court at Naira House. There was one at the fisheries. There is one somewhere, um, I think on High Street around there. Um, there is one at Laplace Carinage. So you are hopping all around castries, dashing between courts, and there's the family court also on, um, is it Pena Street? Uh, Pena Street, I think. So you are dashing all around castries from one court to another. The government, we are presently, I believe, all of those court buildings are being rented out from private owners, from private owners. In my humble view, I'm thinking that the best thing that could happen for the justice system in this country to give it some stability and to restore confidence of some sort is for like we have it in the united in, in in england for all of the courts to be in the same vicinity so you have one area with all of the courts the supreme court the magistrates court, the family court, all of the courts. So you just walk between courts and then you do not have to drive. You do not forget because you are all in the same area. You could run from one court to another without difficulty. So until we come to that day, by the grace of God, I hope we can get there one day, then I believe we'll continue to have problems because you see you go to a court building and you have to retrofit it's not ideal it's, it, it has issues okay. you, you know and it, it's just it's just difficult if we always we live in a makeshift court system from 2015 up to today wow. you know and I, I i wish i had the i had the 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 means i would have donated to the government a few acres of land somewhere and say hey government um build here build a court system build a court a court building you know so that we can all be housed in one location well that's <laughs> that's that's that that's something else i i wasn't i wasn't aware of this uh i think a lot of people watching this episode right now were not aware of this problem um and and maybe i'm the only one but uh yeah, I really was not aware that that was the case. Uh, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. And this is kind of a, a, just a thought that just occurred to me. Um, but I did want to ask you about this topic. Uh, if, if we were to find a spot and build, build the, the buildings that we need and the facilities that we need, right? Mm -hmm. And we also legalized um, the recreational use of marijuana um, and basically changed our approach to recreational drugs in St. Lucia. Um, what impact do you think those two measures would have on the burden uh, facing the justice system at the moment? And first and foremost, I do not know what, um, what are the numbers of people presently incarcerated are uh, incarcerated for the use of marijuana as a recreational well for its recreational uses okay i do not know how many people were caught with a split or two in their pockets and an ounce of in time mm -hmm. it would be interesting to know that number in order to be able to answer that question yeah. accurately but i in, right. in light of the fact that i don't know i will just address what i think is important on that issue first and foremost um Cocaine is a very toxic drug as far as we understand it in our system. We understand it to be much more toxic than marijuana. Right. But in the scheme of things, cocaine and marijuana have the same class. They are both class A drug substances. <laughs> They're both class A substances. I do not think this is the case in the United Kingdom as far as I recall. When I, when I did, when I studied there, I do not think cocaine and marijuana were in the same class, but here they are. They are both class A drugs. Why is so, that? Uh, who, who, why, do you well, know what that I, is? I do not 
That is a very interesting question to ask me, but unfortunately, I want to ask somebody else that question. <laughs> okay. How come, for all its toxicity, that cocaine and marijuana are both class A drugs? So I think before um, they can go about um, decriminalizing marijuana, they first have to decategorize it. They first have to remove it from the same class as cocaine and put it where it belongs. Because I think it's unfair to have it in the same, I have my own personal views about the use of marijuana, which I will not express. Mm -hmm. But I have very, very strong views about the use of it. And maybe if I express them, I might, I might not be invited back on this show. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> so um, I have my very strong views about it. But anyways, as I was saying, I think the first step would be to remove marijuana as a class A drug and leave cocaine and the other drugs of that toxicity in that category. Okay. I think marijuana deserves to be a notch lower because I think it's less damaging, less toxic from our own experience, from what we have seen. All right. Okay, so when they have um, declassified it, then I believe they can talk about decriminalization. But it is still at that category A or class A, and they're talking about, um, about decriminalization. So they might as well decriminalize cocaine. You see <laughs> what I'm saying? Yeah. So they first have to remove the shroud over it and then deal with it. I believe to, I do not, to be honest, I do not believe the, the um, bodily is, is um, inundated with persons or people who have been charged with those kinds of possession offenses. I am not sure what are the categories of, of offenses people are on remand for. It would have been interesting to have done some research as to who is in there for what. But I, although I believe it will make a dent on the um, numbers of arrests, I do not know whether it will make a serious dent on the um, numbers on remand and so on and so forth, because I do not know how many are there for that. But definitely, if it is decriminalized possession, I do not know what kind of uh, um, adages they might, they might put on, whether it's one joint per person. If you're arrested, you'll find it one joint and you say it's for recreational purposes, whether it's two. We do not know what the terms or, or, or what the actual text of that uh, law will be, what it will permit or what it will not permit. But definitely, if it is decriminalized to a certain extent for personal use, I believe, of course, we will see a number of arrests less because i'm sure every week one or two persons are arrested for possession yeah. maybe not of bulk but of small quantities because the police officers tell you they don't have any choice the thing is still a class a drug is still a dangerous drug so they don't have a choice you know so i believe what will happen is that we will see fewer arrests we will see police officers time less time being wasted in, in preferring charges for, for possession of small amounts. We will see less people being in the police stations overnight and their children unattended because of one joint. We will see less of those kinds of situations. Okay. But in terms of the, the large numbers, I do not know if that will make a serious dent in the numbers on remand because I, we, we cannot say that any large numbers on remand for possession of, of drugs. Okay. So basically what I got from that is uh, we're not sure because we don't have the, the numbers. Yeah, we don't have the numbers. <laughs> but possibly. We never know. Well, definitely we can say if it is decriminalized to an extent, then of course there will be fewer arrests because if I'm, I'm going about my business with my one joint for my, my lunch break, I will not be arrested because it's for my personal recreational use. Right. You know, and now if I am found with it, I will be arrested and charged for possession. <laughs> yeah, so definitely the arrest will be fewer. All right. Um, another thing I've been wondering about, we've established that the, the system could use more lawyers, uh, especially the legal aid office. Um, uh, and I also wanted to ask how, how long ago was that legal aid office put in place? Like what year, if you can recall? Um, no, I wouldn't remember the year, but it's, it's quite a recent, um, it's, it's a recent thing, yeah? Uh, in the 2000s, 
It would okay. not have been in the 90s. It would have been in the 2000s. I'm not sure how far back. I don't think it's all that way back. It's not very far along, but it was in the 2000s. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so I, I also wanted to know if, um, how many judges and magistrates do we have available? Do, uh, do we have enough? Do we have enough in judges? Criminal, in, in the criminal court? Yes. Okay, by my um, mental recall, I believe there are about seven magistrates. Seven magistrates and about three judges who run the criminal, who operate the criminal court. Okay. Um, these magistrates also deal with civil issues as well, traffic issues and so on. Um, but there are seven of them and there are three judges of the high court. Um, of course, there would all, always be need for more judges so that the they, they, things can, can move faster, more speedily, but we do not know whether the state can afford it. Okay. Because the, the judges have to be salary, they have to be house, they have to be protected, they, they require um, their personal assistance in terms of securities and drivers and so on, and they have to have proper housing and facilities. So um, all of those things come with, with being a judge. So I do not know at this point in time whether the state can afford it. And even if the state can afford it, whether we have the court facilities to accommodate another more judges at this time in the present, yeah. the current dispensation that we're in. Yeah. You know, so um, of course, there is always need for more judges and more magistrates. But then, as, as we said, since we're running between buildings and renting everything that, that is a court building, I do not know that we have the infrastructure to house more judges. I do not know. I cannot really speak to that because I'm not in the Ministry of Justice. Okay. Okay. Well, it, it really sounds like the arrows keep pointing back to the facilities. It really sounds like we need investment in yes, these, yes. these facilities for the justice system. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that really stands out to me from this conversation. Yes. Um, about bail, is it, because as we were speaking and I was uh, running through the situation in my mind, I really began wondering if it would be possible for uh, a charity organization to be set up to assist mm -hmm. people um, who cannot afford bail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, I think an organization should be set up to counsel people to avoid crime in the first instance. <laughs> that makes sense. If they avoid crime, then there would not be any need for them to to um, to have to need help for bail. Um, yeah, that anything to assist in in keeping the the social fabric protected is is good. And if if it means that. Um, People are not able to afford bail, and they can and they can receive assistance from the general public or from um, organizations. Of course, that would be a good thing. I mean, in the U.S., we have a lot of volunteers going into the prisons and assisting people with their cases. And through those persons, through their goodwill, a lot of people who have been accused of serious crime have found they have proven have, have been able to find their way out back on the streets and the you know sense has been established. Unfortunately, because of our, our system, I mean, we are a very poor country, our resources are limited, it's a hustle out there, so you do not have that level of um, involvement of, of lawyers in, in, in um, people's cases unless they come to you and ask you to, to retain them. But in the bigger countries, lawyers actually go to the jailhouses or to the jail to the jails and, and speak to the people and find out what is their problem and do research. You, under, you understand? Now, yeah. the issue of bail, bail is, is available for every single offense. There was a point when that was not the case, but in, in a recent case that, that was clarified. And so now bail is available for every case. It's just that for the most serious offenses, you have to go to the high court, to a judge of the high court to ask for bail. Mm. And in the less serious offenses, the magistrates continue to exercise um, their jurisdiction on over the grant of bail. Um, but in granting bail or determining whether somebody is entitled to bail, 
a lot of things have to be considered, a lot of factors have to be considered by the magistrate. Um, among those factors are the personal circumstances of the accused, the seriousness of the offense, whether the person has a history of committing offenses of a similar nature while on bail, you know, and a lot of different issues the magistrate has to consider, whether the person is a first time offender and all of those things, whether the person is employed. So if the, the person, the, the magistrate is able to grant bail, the magistrate must not make the bail condition so onerous that it defeats the whole purpose of the grant of bail. She cannot make it too onerous, neither can she make it too easy. It has to be fair and just, considering all of the factors that she has to consider. Now, if after she has granted a bail which is fair in the circumstances, and that that person still cannot meet the bail conditions, then the prosecution now, I believe there's a, a section in the, in the criminal, in the, in, the, in the rules, the criminal procedure rules which speak to that. I can't really recall it now, but those persons who are on remand who cannot afford the bail conditions should be, the cases should be given priority in terms of coming, coming up for trial. All right. So if they have been granted, if somebody has been granted bail say for $2,000, um, in, in surety or appropriate security and the person cannot meet that. And it's, it's, it's a whole year that that person has been granted bail and that person cannot meet it. Then that person's case should be given priority. Right. Once it is realized that that person cannot meet the bail conditions. So that person does not stay in the system and stagnate. And sometimes when that person comes out, the person is found not guilty. So, so you see, it is important that when the person cannot afford bail, that the, the case be um, put on for trial as soon as possible. Yeah, and that makes complete sense. That, that, that should be what we're doing right now. Hopefully, there's, hopefully that is what we're doing right now. Um, I think, I think they, they are trying, you know. They are trying with all of the different challenges that are facing the justice system now. I must say that they, I believe that they are trying. Okay. Doing the best with what they have, yeah? Doing the best with what they have. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I, I really thank you for taking the time out to have this conversation with me. And right before we head out of the door, I want you to just dream a little bit with me, right? Mm -hmm. um, if Imagine the next 20 years in St. Lucia, right? Um, the next 20 years and the justice system has gotten everything right you know mm -hmm. everything has been fixed and the the system is working like clockwork um and you know it's a very happy time so <laughs> what uh, what what changes do you think have been made to get there okay well what i think would have been made to get there is that um the just the, the the halls of justice would have a home. Oh yeah, yeah. A fixed place of abode, <laughs> on the one roof, in the same general location, so that lawyers and litigants can move from one court to the next without having to drive. That's the first thing I see. The next thing I see is the list of people on remand in prison awaiting the trial should be reviewed at least every three months at, or at appropriate intervals so that no person falls through the cracks okay. and remains unnecessarily incarcerated and without due process. I'm thinking also that perhaps this would, this would only come to fruition if somebody called a remands officer is appointed to ensure that while the lawyers in the Crown Prosecution Office and the DPP goes to court and, and the bodily correctional officers do their work, that one person is responsible just for remands to ensure that everybody's day in court, um, it comes and it is adjourned and they have that record and they are responsible for remands. That person preferably should be maybe um, somebody with a, a law degree or something like that so they understand the process. So that would be cheaper for the government 
than for them to be paying loads of money when somebody slips through the cracks and ends up spending years in prison when they should have been out in a few days. Right. So I see that happening. I see a remands officer is what is needed to help in that process. I also see a legal aid office being given adequate resources to defend those who cannot defend themselves privately. Yeah. And this is important in light of the sacrosanct principle that every man is presumed to be innocent until he is found guilty. So the burden is on the prosecution to prove the guilt of the, of the accused. So if the accused cannot put up a lawyer to defend himself, the state has to ensure that they have an adequately manned legal aid office to provide that service to the accused. Because he might very well be a very innocent man. Right. And by the way, given the size of St. Lucia, how, how many uh, people do you see working in this perfect world legal aid office? Um, I see a legal aid office having at least five lawyers. Okay. I see at least five lawyers in the legal aid, legal aid office. And I believe among themselves, they could organize the thing in such a way that the people are adequately represented. Okay. All right. Also, um, the last two things I see are that persons charged with murder can have their trials within 60 days. And those with less serious offenses can have their trials within 45 days of arrest. Mm -hmm. Now that is what the, the criminal procedure rules contemplate, but that never happens. So in an ideal world, I'm seeing that we can follow those protocols and everybody work towards achieving those kinds of mandates. Right. And finally, I see police stations, I said so earlier, having the assistance of an assigned public prosecutor that they can liaise with. So if there are 10 public prosecutors, maybe one per district or two per district, so if I'm a police officer in a Mikud station and I have a, a matter that I'm not sure what to do, I can call Jack Jones, who is the one assigned to Miku, and say, Mr. Jack Jones, I know it's Sunday, but I've arrested somebody and I want advice as to how to proceed. Um, this is the section of the code I'm minded to, to, to um, charge under, but can you advise? So that police officer is less likely to embarrass the Crown Prosecution officers when they go to court with that case only to find that the police officer made a total blunder with the process. So I see that, I see that as um, one of the last things that can be done to assist in, in giving, bringing us closer to a perfect um, situation. Okay, and I, I want to say that's very well said, um, very well quantified. Um, and also, honestly, it does not sound very difficult like <laughs> it does not sound very difficult but i guess it's always about it stops the but it stops with the buck the buck i mean the buck is what controls everything right all we hear is that the country does not have money to afford those things yeah uh yeah. well yeah, i think i think uh well in fact i want to take the opportunity to plead with uh the administrations that will hear this in the future the current administration uh, every every administration that is to come uh, to make criminal justice, make the justice system and the appropriate investments in the justice system a priority. Uh, we need it um, as just as much as I spoke to Dr. Gabriel about healthcare um, the two weeks ago. Uh, we need a, a, a justice system that works well because people are impacted. Um, when people are held on pretrial or in, in, in remand, um, they, their families miss them. They, 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 they can't provide, they're not productive. Um, they're missing out on their children growing up. Um, these, are, these are real lives that are being affected. And so I really want to plead with um, the people who can make a difference um, to uh, do so. And it'll, viewers and listeners, if you're watching this, uh, you can help by you know, uh, sharing this, uh, taking some, some of what um, Mrs. Faisal shared with us today and, um, and asking why aren't these things being done? Why, why can't we make these changes? Um, what's preventing us from making these changes? And let's make some noise and see if it's possible to make positive change. All right. So, uh, Mrs. Faisal, do you have anything else uh, before we head out of the door? Uh, 
not really, but just to hope and pray that um, I will live to see the day when we will have our halls of justice in one single location in St. Louis. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to put that in the, the topic of this episode. Let, let's get that done. Because um, I, I think that will make, I think you've, you've really uh, shown us how that would make a big difference. Um, and so that being said, thank you again so much for joining us on this episode. Um, it, was, it was exactly what I envisioned the conversation being, which was very informative, very productive. And I really learned a lot uh, more than I knew before about uh, what, what exactly is going on. Um, and viewers and listeners, I think y'all can share my sentiment. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed every minute. Thanks. Oh, okay. Um, viewers and listeners, you will see us again. Uh, y'all know I always have to check for y'all. Uh, you will see us again on the 29th. Family Reflections will be back on, will be back on the 29th of the month. Uh, and that's it. Bye for now. See you later. Bye. Yeah.